I'm Anita, and I'm glad to see everybody. And I have a professional as well as personal friend that's going to visit with us today, Judy Gibbs. And uh, let me give a formal introduction of Judy. Judy is a JD and is chair of the Kansas City Metro Elder Abuse Task Force. In addition to being chair of the Kansas City Metro Elder Abuse Task Force, she's also an appeals prosecutor of Domestic Violence Unit of Kansas City, Missouri Prosecutor's Office and has 40 plus years as a prosecutor. She holds the title of Professor Emeritus from Avila University, where she taught School of Business for 36 years. I'm just thrilled that Judy is with us. Whatever Judy does, she does very well. So we're in for a very um, good presentation. So please join me in welcoming Judy Gibbs. Um, just as a little background, I started out as a prosecutor in um, 1975, prosecuting child abuse cases at Jackson County Juvenile Court. Um, and then I became a municipal prosecutor and I've been prosecuting domestic violence. You know, we started getting organized and working on, on domestic violence about 30 years ago. So I had that background of child abuse resources and things that were already in place and then working on domestic violence, when in 2009, I saw the first um, real working on elder abuse. And I thought, oh, we are so far behind in elder abuse. Um, and I decided it was something that I wanted to be involved in. My parents were missionaries for the um, Community of Christ, used to be reorganized Latter-day Saint Church. And my mother always worked with seniors. That was just what she did as a missionary's wife was to work with the older people in the congregation. So I came by that um, naturally, felt really um, happy when I was with older people. So that was kind of the background I had when I started getting involved in elder abuse. Um, we didn't have anything in place on the Missouri side on elder abuse. Um, we never you know, in the domestic violence world, we didn't talk to the adult protective service workers. That wasn't part of what we did. And we didn't work, you know, we worked with law enforcement, but we didn't work with a lot of different organizations that work on the senior side of things, working with older adults. So that's what we first did was get everybody together and figure out who everybody was and then uh, start working on trying to get organized on things. I'm going to um, try and bring up my PowerPoint here. So I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, so um, thank you for letting me share with you a little bit of what I've learned in the elder abuse world. Um, I'm gonna talk about recognizing elder abuse, um, responding to elder abuse, some prevention of elder abuse, um, and then talk about some of the resources that are available here. So I'd like to talk about uh, start off with what is elder abuse so we all have the same understanding about what we're talking about here. Uh, what we think we know this many years into it, when I started out back in 2009, we didn't have any research studies and statistics and things. Um, and we've had a lot of that along the way. Um, I'd like to talk about some of the dynamics we see that we think are leading to elder abuse. Um, and I'd like to talk about um, kind of the red flags so that people can recognize elder abuse, um, signs and symptoms, and then um, response and what people can do, what you can do um, in when you recognize elder abuse, and then some of the prevention and resources um, that are out there. So generally elder abuse is any knowing, intentional or negligent act negligence being where you have a duty to do something and you don't do it, or a duty to refrain from doing something and you do do it. So any knowing intentional or negligent act by a caregiver or by any other person that causes harm or serious risk of harm to a vulnerable adult. And a vulnerable adult is a term that is used in the statutes and different states have different statutes. Um, and so I said here, the definitions of elder abuse can vary um, between states and a definition is of who is an elder or a vulnerable adult um, can also vary between states. 
I'm on the Missouri side where our definition of an elder is 60 and here in Kansas, it's the same. Um, and a vulnerable adult is someone who is 18 or older who has a disability who, um, where they can't care for their own needs. Another uh, definition that you'll hear about is someone who's an eligible adult. And that means they're eligible for services that are provided by the state or by the federal government. Um, so we think we know some things now about elder abuse. Um, it'll be interesting to see the studies that come out after the pandemic to see if any of this has changed. Um, but now they're saying that one in 10 adults who are 60 or older who live at home have suffered um, elder abuse within the past year. This was a study that was first done back in 2009 and has been repeated um, at different times. Um, and this will be interesting to see whether this changes um, as they study after the pandemic. 47% um, of adults who have dementia experience uh, have experienced um, elder abuse. So your chances of being the um, subject of elder abuse go up if you're suffering from dementia or other um, disabilities, mental disabilities or physical disabilities. And what we've also learned in recent years um, is that the elder abuse triples the risk of premature death and causes unnecessary illness, injury and suffering. And elder abuse is definitely underreported. So the current belief is that for every one case of elder abuse that comes to the attention of responsible entities, another 23 never come to light. People um, don't report being the subject of elder abuse either because they're embarrassed or they're afraid uh, or for other reasons. Um, so it's definitely underreported. And so it's important that people be able to recognize elder abuse and then also that they will report elder abuse. Early on when we got into this, um, we thought we were seeing some of the causes or the dynamics of elder abuse. Our early observations were that sometimes abuse occurred because the caregiver was overwhelmed. Um, they had taken on more than they could cope with in terms of caring for an uh, an older adult relative or someone who had disabilities. Um, and so they would get overwhelmed and that would result in abuse. So that was one dynamic we saw. Um, one of the things we've seen over and over again is that either the, the abused person or the abuser is dependent on the other person. Uh, during the pandemic, we've had a lot of issues where someone with a mental health um, illness uh, has moved in with an elderly relative um, because of the pandemic and financial concerns. And, and then there was abuse in that situation. Um, so we'll see some more of this. Um, we found that the abuser being isolated is a significant factor in um, elder abuse. And a lot of times we've seen that there may be an entitled adult child in the home who is taking advantage of the senior of the older adult. They feel like they're entitled to take the, the money or spend the resources on themselves um, or you know, not to do the things they need to do to care for the older adult. And we've seen not only the family being protective of the abuser, but the uh, victim of the abuse being protective of the abuser. One of the things I do is read police reports from the Kansas City Police Department and file charges. We can file the charges, but we're dependent upon the victim to, te to testify. And a lot of times they're willing to tell the police what happened, but when it comes to actually carrying through and testifying against the person who abused them, um, they're not willing to do that. Uh, I sat in on the Johnson County uh, FAST team meeting this morning on Zoom. Um, and they were talking in that meeting about situations where they know the abuse occurred, but the victim is protecting the abuser. 
And so they have trouble pursuing those kinds of cases. Um, we've had some models that have been developed along the way to try and understand um, some of the characteristics and dynamics leading to elder abuse. Um, the first thing they did was they took the domestic violence power and control will, um, you know, where it's the cycle of violence um, if for domestic violence, and they modified that. Um, and that would ex was helpful, I think, in explaining those situations where it was a situation where someone was actually using power and control over an older adult. Um, but that's not the only situation we see in elder abuse. Um, and one of the more helpful uh, models that's been developed, I think, is this one that was developed really to help us um, in intervention in elder abuse. So here on the left side, you have the vulnerable adult, and they may be vulnerable because they have impaired physical function. And so they're dependent on someone else to help them, sometimes a trusted other to help them or a family member, caregiver. Um, they may have impaired cognition. Um, they may suffer from mental illness or drug addiction or other kinds of emotional distress. Um, and if you put that in the same environment where you have the trusted other who is taking advantage of them or is dependent upon them or maybe suffering from mental illness themselves or have impaired physical function, um, you know, we can have a higher risk of elder mistreatment in that situation. And then down here at the bottom, you have other influences that come into play. So you may have so, uh, cultural norms. Some families say, we always keep our seniors at home. We don't put them in nursing homes. Uh, we don't put them in care facilities. Well, that's fine if you can care for the senior at home. But if that means grandma's laying on the floor in her own feces, that's not acceptable. Um, if you have uh, social isolation, if you have some low quality relationships, there may be situations where um, there's a low quality relationship between um, a parent and a child for whatever reason. It may be that the, even the parent was an abusive parent. And so now you have the adult child taking care of the person who was an abusive parent. And you may have situations like that where it's um, going to add to the risk of elder mistreatment in those situations. Also on the cultural norms, you may have, I was talking to a friend of mine um, in Hawaii and they were telling me how they have a lot of um, financial exploitation out of um, some of the culture over there where there is the expectation that the older son will always take care of the money for the widow and the, the mother in the situation. And so if you have that cultural norm of, you know, the, the eldest son is always going to take care of the money. Well, if they don't take care of mom with the money that's left, then you may have you know, financial exploitation and abusive situation in that kind of uh, cultural norm. And there are other ones that would apply there. So the types of elder abuse that we um, see, we see uh, physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse. That's something people don't necessarily want to talk about with older adults, but definitely occurs, and we'll talk some more about that. Um, neglect of um, older adults, abandonment of older adults, or financial exploitation of older adults. So in the physical abuse, um, a lot of different kinds of physical abuse, striking someone. I had a case recently where the son was striking the mother with the uh, refrigerator door. That was a one I hadn't seen before. Um, I had one where the gentleman was in a wheelchair and his caregiver was hitting him over the head with her purse. And he said, it felt like there was a brick in that purse. So it could be striking someone, hitting them with something, uh, pushing, shoving, shaking, slapping, um, burning them. I had a case where it was burnt. They burned them in the shower, shoved them into the hot water and burned them. Um, and then also you have the situations of inappropriate use of drugs, restraints, force feeding, um, and other kinds of physical punishment. And these are the kinds of things that you might see from the physical abuse. 
um, things you would expect to see, but then also the last one down there, broken eyeglasses, torn clothing, burn marks or other signs of punishment. Um, you know, what happened to the person's hearing aid? Did it get knocked out and lost when they were struck by somebody? Um, you know, where's the wheelchair? How did it get broken? Those kinds of situations too. And of course, if the person is re reporting the abuse, that would certainly be a red flag. If you see sudden change in their behavior, they've been real interactive with you and then suddenly they're withdrawn. Um, you know, they're the caregivers, the family members are refusing to let other people see them. Why is that? Are they, you know, don't want to, you not want you to see the bruises? What, what is it they don't want you to know? Um, in the sexual abuse area, um, this would be any non-consensual sexual contact with an older adult. So non-consensual or sexual contact with a person who's incapable of giving consent. And certainly there are different kinds of things that could happen in, in this arena. This last one on the list, the sexually explicit photography, I never dreamed of that happening until there was a case where caregivers were posing people in nursing homes, folks they were supposed to be taking care of, posing them in sexually explicit positions and then taking photographs and sharing those with their friends. Um, some of the signs and symptoms, the red flags that you might see there are um, bruises around their genital area or breasts, unexplained venereal diseases, just like we used to have in the child abuse areas, um, you know, torn clothing, bloody underclothing, and of course them reporting anything in terms of inappropriate touching and feeling uncomfortable with people um, touching them or who are taking care of them. In the emotional or psychological abuse, that could be verbal assaults, harassment, threats, intimidation, um, inflicting them, the silent treatment on them, um, you know, taking them away from their normal inter social interactions that they have with people, isolating them. And the kinds of signs or symptoms you see of that are people becoming upset and agitated or withdrawn, could be either way. Um, reporting it, of course, um, and the kinds of things that you normally attribute to dementia, like sucking, biting, or rocking themselves. Um, in Missouri, we passed a uh, elder bullying statute um, in the last couple of years. I looked in Kansas and didn't see a comparable statute um, on the Kansas side. Uh, but certainly you have laws that protect against um, emotional abuse. But the reason we have this on the Missouri side is that there was a senator whose uh, mother moved into a assisted living facility and she was bullied by some of the other residents, a clique of residents at that facility. And so he went to work and got us a um, elder bullying statute to try and uh, take action in those kinds of cases. Um, in um, elder abuse, there's also elder neglect. And this could be, uh, I was at the FAST team uh, meeting, they were talking about that during the pandemic, they've had calls from facilities saying that family members who were supposed to be paying the residents' bills weren't paying the bills. I don't know if that's, you know, because they couldn't or what was going on, but those would be the kinds of things if someone has a responsibility to pay the bills, um, and aren't paying the bills, then that would fall under the area of neglect, providing the necessities, the financial necessities for that. Um, you know, they would be the fiduciary who's supposed to pay the necessary expenses that are provided for. Um, see the other kinds of things here. We also have abandonment. Um, where someone who has taken responsibility for an older adult, whether that's contractually or by practice, has taken that on, and then they just abandon the person. They, um, I've had situations where older people have basically been put on a bus and left on the bus, and the mass transit authority finds them and has to figure out who they are and what's happened and, um, you know, just 
they give up on taking care of them and don't provide for any continuity of care in that situation. But we also have self-neglect. And self-neglect is uh, where someone is behaving such that their own health or safety is at stake. Now, if you are mentally competent, you are entitled to neglect yourself if you want to. If you wanna to drink too much, if you wanna not take care of things that should be taken care of, you're entitled to do that if you're competent. But if someone is not competent um, and then they are acting in ways or not, being, not providing for their own needs, um, then that would fall in the area of self-neglect. And you would have the agencies who work with um, elder abuse involved in these situations. I had someone upset with me because I wouldn't prosecute the guy who was being paid to buy the guy's alcohol for him. He was an alcohol, the gentle, older gentleman was an alcoholic, but he had capacity, so he was entitled to. So they won't get involved in, you know, changing somebody's behavior if they have mental capacity and they're choosing to make that decision. Okay. Another area is the financial exploitation. And that's why you have the Johnson County financial abuse team, the FAST team here in Johnson County. Um, and they're looking at things like actual theft. You could have um, caretakers going into someone's home to take care of them, stealing jewelry. You could have family members stealing their jewelry or their drugs. That happened in my household. Um, people who were cleaning for me took my husband's drugs. Um, you could have uh, abuse by a fiduciary. And that definitely happens. Um, someone who's supposed to be taking care of someone's finances for them um, takes those resources and uses them for themselves or someone else. I was helping my husband's uncle with his affairs when he was in his mid 90s and he had um, a lot of rental real estate and there was a real estate agent who just kept on selling him properties even past when uh, my husband's uncle could even tell you what property he had. I had to track down property all over the Kansas City area, things that were overgrown or that the plumbing had been stripped out of because he didn't even remember that he had bought that real estate. But the real estate agent was making a commission every time he sold one of these pieces of property. Um, and he continued to do that until we got involved in that situation. Um, you have fraud, which is intentional misrepresentation to people, and you have all the scams. And then, of course, we have all the agencies that are involved these days in helping us recognize the scams. Um, but, you know, they come up with new ones all the time. Last week, I was getting calls telling me not to use any of my Apple um, products, that that had been um, compromised. And, but they told me to call them back on my iPhone. I was like, I think that's inconsistent. So I recognized that right off as a scam that, that they were just trying to uh, probably get money from me. So here's a couple of scenarios um, of common situations. Um, in this case, we have Norma who's age 80, living with her adult son, Doug, who's diagnosed with a mental illness. Um, in that case was paranoid schizophrenia. And during the call um, with Norma, you discover that Doug has frequently attacked him both verbally and physically. And you and Norma FaceTime and you're able to see that she's got bruises on her face. And she pleads with you, you know, to uh, keep this all a secret and to pray for her son. Um, Another situation, Tom is living now in a uh, care facility and he's being verbally abused and threatened by staff. He reports that um, he's had items um, stolen from him and they're um, not doing anything about it and threatening him um, if he reports that to anybody. These are actual situations. So what can you do? What can anybody do? 
Um, well, one thing you can do is keep in contact with your older adult friends. Um, keep in contact with your older adult family members, your church um, friends, all of the folks that are older adults, and just keep in touch with them, listen to them, ask questions. You know, you can always ask open-ended questions like, well, how's it going? You know, how's it going with Doug? And how's he doing? And, um, you know, how are you doing? And things like that. But there are also um, screening tools. The National Center on Elder Abuse has put together a fact sheet that lists all the different screening tools that healthcare professionals can use. Um, but certainly just lay people can use these for ideas of questions to ask. This sheet was put together by the Elder Safe um, organization. And um, you know, it has questions like, um, has anyone taken something from you without your permission? Um, has anyone stopped you from seeing friends? And, you know, has your life changed such a, <laughs> I guess this wasn't a very good one for during the pandemic, but um, you know, are they intentionally keeping you away from things that you should be doing? Are you afraid of anyone that you know? Um, does anyone in your household have access to weapons? Another question on there, but there's a whole range of questions that could be asked in there. But anyhow, if you suspect elder abuse, just suspect it. You don't have to have proof. If you suspect it, what you can do in that situation is certainly call law enforcement and let them know about your concerns. You can call and should call the elder abuse hotline. And there are also other state and federal agencies that you could report to. Um, on, when you call law enforcement, when you call 911, that's gonna be a criminal investigation. They're gonna come at it from the criminal side in terms of has a crime been committed. Also, they have, most cities now have their crisis intervention teams. We're working a lot with those um, over in Kansas City, Missouri right now with all of the mental health issues that we're seeing. But, you know, they know, they've usually worked with folks in the community um, and know some of the folks who may have mental health issues um, and they can um, help in these situations. Um, I had a CIT officer recently who on his day off went out to pick up an older gentleman to come to court to testify in a case. Um, he wouldn't come with him and we weren't able to prosecute the case, but we did get the um, state agencies went for a guardianship on um, the abuser and um, has removed the abuser from the home under a guardianship. So um, when you report to the elder abuse hotline, and I'll give you the names and uh, the numbers and the um, internet links here in a minute, um, those folks who are gonna respond when you call the elder abuse hotline are social workers. And so they're going to be helping the victim with getting the sources, getting the resources they need uh, to either stay safely in the home by themselves um, or to address um, needs that they have. I had one of them call me this week asking me if um, I knew where a person who was in a wheelchair who couldn't pay their utility bills could get a refrigerator. Um, and we're tracking that all down from them. They couldn't afford to get a refrigerator when it went out, but um, you know, they're going to provide social services. Um, and they also have the SIU units. Those are the criminal investigators. They're usually former police officers who will go after the financial exploitation um, or the abuse situations and work with the law enforcement folks to pursue cases where they um, ought to pursue cases. Um, you have the state agencies, the state attorney general, the Federal Trade Commission, and I'll give you some more of these resources um, when we get to resources. But um, on the Missouri side, if I can't figure out how to address a situation, one of the folks I call is down at the state attorney general's Medicaid unit. It's Medicaid fraud is their unit, but they do a whole lot more than that. They have a forensic nurse 
who will get in there and dig through medical records and they have folks who will dig through financial records um, and see if you know we can maybe go at uh, elder abuse, financial abuse or physical abuse through something that they can do. Um, so there are some other fallback agencies that you can work with. Certainly you can participate in local groups who are working on elder abuse. So this is just a list of some of the things that you can do. Um, so reporting elder abuse, these are the elder abuse hotline numbers, both in Missouri and Kansas. You can uh, make those calls anonymously. Um, and when you do call, it is confidential and the statute provides you immunity from being sued for making the report if someone thought you made the report. As long as it's done in good faith, you have immunity from civil prosecution. Um, and if you're looking for things out of state, that's what the um, other things on this slide address. The elder care locator, that's a national map that you can find services in other states. And some other things. Um, now you can do elder abuse reporting online. I'm doing all of my elder abuse reporting online now through the Missouri link. Um, and what they want to know when you make a report is they want to know the names of the abuser, the abused, any witnesses. They want to know if there's a relationship between those folks. You know, is this an adult child? Um, what is the relationship? They don't have one for boyfriend, girlfriend. It just says friends. I don't like that. I don't like that, but they, that's how they have it on ours. Um, they want to know identifying information if you have it. They'd like to have social security numbers if you have it. I have police reports and even on police reports, sometimes they don't have social security numbers. So a lot of times you're not gonna have all the information they'd like to have, but they can track that down if you give them the names and addresses, um, those kinds of things. Um, here in Kansas, your uh, state agency has put together uh, brochures on reporting elder abuse. Um, they have one here on the Kansas Adult Protective Services, what they do and what they can't do. That's an important thing to know. Um, you know, if the person has capacity, they're never going to make them do something. If they suspect they don't have capacity, then the Adult Protective Services may be, may get involved in, um, you know, getting that substantiated and then taking it taking action through a guardianship or a conservatorship. Um, but they have uh, brochures on financial exploitation. These are all on their website. All this information is on their website. They also have one here called understanding your role as a power of attorney. So if you have the power of attorney for someone, it sets up what you should and, and shouldn't do. Um, in, on, in the state of Kansas, it requires certain people, the state law requires certain people to report elder abuse to the Department of Children and uh, Families, DCF. And failure to report is um, a class B misdemeanor. Any other person who suspects abuse, neglect, exploitation, or uh, fiduciary abuse may also report and do that confidentially and be protected if they make that report. And they have this whole long list of folks who have to report, who are mandated reporters. Um, one of the questions I get is, will I find out what happens if I report to the hotline? And the answer probably is no, you won't actually find out what they do, but they will let you know that they have received the report and can give you um, verification that you have made the report um, if you, especially if you're a mandated reporter and need proof that you made the report. This is off of their website there. In Missouri, we've joined a few states that say any person is a mandated reporter if they have reasonable cause to suspect that there is elder abuse that there's um, an eligible person, someone who fits the definition of, el of an eligible person for services. If they're um, 
There's the likelihood of suffering serious physical harm or bullying and in need of protective services. And then Missouri has a whole long list too of folks who are mandated reporters and have to report. We have even a longer list. Um, and uh, notice that it also says ministers. So if you have any folks who are lay ministers, they're mandated reporters in the state of Missouri. I last made this um, some of this presentation to a group of ministers. Um, so that's one of the reasons it's highlighted there. So talking about um, causes and prevention and um, response, things that you can do. One of the things that we know is that isolation um, is a really bad situation for um, the risk of elder abuse. And there's been a lot of research done starting back in the 60s on the harm that um, loneliness and social isolation can do to people. And the most recent estimate was this $7 billion a year in increased hospital stays. That was a study that was done um, by the medical uh, professionals on um, the effects of loneliness. And I thought this one was interesting that loneliness was equal to smoking 15 cigarettes a day and all the results from that. So some of the strategies are of course, to avoid the isolation, the, that risk, um, one of the risks of elder abuse. And of course you can do individual interventions, um, you know, having calling circles and things like that. Um, there's also organized group interventions, um, call chains, churches have their call chains sometimes. Um, organizations have set up before the um, pandemic, uh, friendship and chat benches around where seniors would be so that people who were trained could actually just sit there and wait to talk to older adults and um, get them talking and to in engage with them. Uh, there are befriending services and that's of course all virtual these days. Um, they used to work more on some of the co-living and co-housing arrangements, um, but there have of course been some concerns with that um, anytime they're looking at doing that now, uh, they have very strict contracts. Um, so they have to address those kinds of issues. One of the things I want to mention here is the circle of friends. Uh, I think you kind of have your own circle of friends here, but this is an organized program that came out of Helsinki. Uh, we recently um, had a lot of um, Zoom conferences about organizing circle of friends. Um, and it's an organized where you work on setting up um, Zoom meetings now with groups of people, originally eight people, and they would meet um, 12 times over a three month period um, and have actual you know, schedule of topics and speakers on um, arts and activities, uh, group exercise and health concerns, um, and also journaling and writing um, and cr more creative kinds of things. It, creative expressions. Um, here on, in the Kansas City area, the Shepherd Center has taken the lead in um, assisting and developing the circle of friends um, over on the Missouri side. And we're having like weekly Zoom um, learning how to do that. The idea is that you would organize these and get them going and then they'd become self-sustaining and these people would be friends. I think of them like our Mahjong group. Uh, I play Mahjong with Anita and some of the friends that I started out with a juvenile court, you know, 40 plus years ago. Um, and, you know, just having that weekly contact and having other eyes on the situations, people that you can rely on um, who would pay attention if something happened to you. So um, on financial exploitation, the, um, the, uh, I've been to a lot of Zoom conferences recently on the uh, neuroscience, on um, how people are scammed. And um, what I've learned from that is that the scam artists target our reptilian brain, that, you know, that immediate reaction of fear, um, risk, our basic drives, um, not the things where we make good judgments. Um, and they, you know, they tell you this 
you see the things on TV where they're cautioning people against the scams that exist. Um, anything where they're um, speaking with authority, this is the IRS, the Department of Justice, you know, the, this is the sheriff, we're gonna arrest you, you know, whoever, uh, speaking with authority and urgency, you know, that if you don't do this right now, something terrible is going to happen. Um, they use the emotional triggers going after concern about your grandchildren or your friends. Um, you know, I just recently got the Gmail again, the one where, you know, somebody's who is my normal person I talked to on the phone, well, I was getting a Gmail from them saying that they needed money. They were in a terrible situation and needed money. Um, so they, they hit those emotional triggers that um, create this need to respond to them. Um, and if you're interested in any of these areas, there's, that's one thing the pandemic has been wonderful for is there's so many webinars on these topics and so many good speakers on these things now. There's a whole lot to learn in this area and that um, education is available. Well, my experience with um, financial exploitation, I was telling you about this uncle who was financially exploited by the, my husband's uncle who was financially exploited by the real estate agent. Well, he was financially exploited by the girlfriend that he found who had just gotten out of substance abuse treatment and you know, by other people. Um, I've uh, found that um, it's really good in those situations to have at least three separate sets of eyes on any situation. If you're gonna try and help somebody with their finances, make sure you're not the only person who's helping them with their finances. Um, make sure that you have other people um, so you aren't setting yourself up for uh, claims that you are financially exploiting them or doing something that you shouldn't do uh, because the family members will certainly, and the other folks who have been exploiting them will um, certainly try and make those claims. Um, so make sure um, that you have at least three sets of eyes. In his situation, I was writing the checks to pay his bills but I was sending a monthly accounting to his personal attorney and I had his best friend who did care a lot about him also involved in any of the financial decision-making. Um, and I had family members who still don't speak to me to this day because you know, I didn't do what they wanted me to do with his money. Um, certainly pre-planning with elder lawyers but make sure that you're actually talking to people who are licensed. I heard in that fast call today about someone who was a elder financial planner who they were gonna be checking into his licensing because they questions as to whether they were actually, um, you know, financially abusing someone or whether they were actually helping them. Um, so. One of the questions I get a lot is what if somebody has capacity? They have their mental capacity, but they're choosing to go ahead and give their money away to their family members. I had a lady um, who runs a um, meal program and she was telling me about someone who came there when they could come there for lunch every day because she was giving her money away to her family members instead of taking care of herself. And as long as they have capacity, they can certainly choose to do that. They're not gonna keep them from doing that. But what can you do in that situation? There isn't a lot of good answers, but the answer I've come up with is to keep in contact with them, be as supportive as possible, and just be patient and persistent, and then be there when they realize that they've run out of money and you know they've got problems themselves because that's inevitably what seems to happen in that situation um okay so local resources and um got a few minutes here for questions after i talk about this so johnson county kansas does have your financial abuse specialist team they've got law enforcement they have the police officers there from different um, jurisdictions. They had the Johnson County uh, Prosecutor's Office. They had several folks from that. 
Uh, Marissa Bell is the person who recently did this name down at the bottom. She recently did that elder abuse training that they put on. Uh, but today's um, FAST team, the invitation to that meeting went out from Vanessa Rebelli, R-I-E-B-L-I. -E She's the section chief with the Johnson County District Attorney's Office. And that meeting was wonderful in terms of them talking about cases and sharing information and asking questions and figuring out where they could get information and how they could um, work together, like with the... Um, Secret Service on a particular case and how to handle things. Uh, so that's really great that, um, that you've got that here in Johnson County for the financial abuse, but they were also talking about physical abuse cases in that meeting. You have your area agency on aging. The federal government passes out federal money to um, agencies in the states and that's divided up by county. Um, and so you have your area agency on here in Johnson County, Kansas. And they handle a lot of things, um, caregiver support, nutrition services, um, all kinds of things. We have all our resources over in Missouri. You have your state resources. And I'm just gonna run through here. Um, you're not really interested in these things until you need them. And so I just want you to know they exist um, and that you can get to this information. Um, and then the, on the federal side, there are at least 13 different federal agencies involved in services to older adults. Um, and the US Senate Special Committee on Aging um, has a top 10 fraud book on the different frauds, scams that are out there and all the information about the different um, agencies. They have the National Center on Elder Abuse and they put out a lot of um, good material. The Federal Trade Commission are the folks who identify the scams um, and they have a state by state where you can go in there and see what the common frauds are that are being perpetrated in your area. The Department of Justice Elder Justice Initiative works with prosecutors and law enforcement. And then of course, our Office on Violence Against Women um, also works with abuse in later life and that's age 55 or higher. Uh, June 15th is World Elder Abuse Awareness Day every year. And um, we had to do everything virtual this last year, but the year before we had um, a lot of different activities in the metro area, um, and they had a lot of different activities all over the world uh, trying to do awareness about uh, elder abuse. And just some other resources. This is, um, you notice I talk about older adults. That comes from the Reframing Elder Abuse Project, where they've actually done marketing to see what works in terms of talking to people about elder abuse. Um, and then there's a lot of resources out there on anti-ageism. That would be a whole nother discussion. Um, but there's just some websites here that I think are great, blogs and other kinds of things here on anti-ageism. I have to ask myself anti-ageism questions all the time um, now that I'm more aware of it. So just wanted to share those resources with you. Okay, so that's my presentation. Uh, what questions can I answer? Um, Judy, uh, that was fantastic. And uh, what I liked, and I'm sure the rest of us liked, was um, the amount of information you gave was so good, and that you uh, related personal incidents that you have dealt with as well as professional. And then you talked about the county, the state, and did both uh, Kansas and Missouri. But thank you, thank you so much. Um, just one very general question. Um, what, how can you possibly, um, what's the word I want to use, convince, um, help people that are reporting uh, elder abuse, but they don't want to testify? What, you just throw up your hands or what, what do you do to help people? Well, uh, we talk to them in terms of what they want to accomplish themselves. Mm -hmm. What do you want to have happen here? And I, I bring out that wheel and actually mm -hmm. show it to them in terms of 
you know, your risk of elder abuse is high because you have this person who maybe has a mental illness issue or a substance abuse issue in your home, and that isn't just going to go away. So if you're not going to testify and help us deal with it from this perspective, what other kinds of things are you going to do um, that will... Um, so we talk about that, we talk about the safety planning and what it is they want to accomplish. A lot of times it's just like with domestic violence. Well, mm -hmm. you know, if you're not going to testify, but you're successful at getting them out of your house, if that's what you want to have happen, they're just going to go do this to somebody else. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's kind of a guilt trip, but you're be responsible for this happening. And we see it just like we see in domestic violence. You know, I've had the same defendants with three different women. Well, mm -hmm. I've had elder abuse situations with at least two at this point, mm -hmm. different victims, um, you know, and you know, we need to get them, the perpetrator, the services, as well as mm -hmm. getting you the protection that you need. So, um, but a lot of times, and I saw this in the folks from the FAST team talking today, that they just may not be able to do anything. Okay. Do mm -hmm. you think that they're not wanting to testify because they feel like they need that individual? Sometimes that's definitely the situation. Or it may be something, you know, the gentleman in the wheelchair who's being hit over the head. And that was about the fifth time I'd had her for hitting, for assaulting him in some way. You know, they've been together for 30 years and have kids and, you know, they have that emotional connection and he knows she has mental health issues. And, you know, that's the one we had to intervene and get the state to take a guardianship on. So if they take guardianship, then, then can they remove her from the home? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, if, if she takes her meds, she's fine. Right. But if she chooses not to take her meds, then, and you can't make them take the meds no. you know, unless you have some kind of authority. So I felt bad keeping mentally ill people in jail, but, you know, about the fourth time I became reconciled to it, that at least he wasn't getting beaten up, but. He well, the hard, the hard part is, is when they're harming somebody. Yeah. You know, you'd like them to get help, but if they're hurting somebody in the process, that's tough. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have questions? Oh, I have a question. Well, my question is, um, so what percentage of convictions are there in either Missouri or Kansas of the cases of elder abuse? I don't know an actual statistic on that. Um, I don't know the answer to that one. Just because, you know, it sometimes takes so long for any cases to get through our legal system. So I just, I didn't know if there was a percentage that you knew off the top of your head. So I don't know. No, I don't know. And, you know, we might, we don't keep it at municipal court um, we don't keep that statistics broken out. A lot of these are domestic violence and we keep our domestic violence statistics, but we don't, and, but we do have victims by age, but those aren't necessarily all elder abuse kinds yeah. of situations. Um, but there's also the county prosecutors prosecuting the cases and I don't know what their statistics are. That's okay. a good question. Judy, this is Donna. I, um, I, I certainly appreciate all of this wonderful information that you've, you've shared with us. I, um, you did, however, bring up at the, the very end um, the term anti-ageism. And I know that you said that that's a, a different topic, but um, I wondered if you might just sort of generally define that for us. I'm, a, I'm afraid when I hear that, I think of a, um, you know, a cosmetic product or something. And, uh, <laughs> Well, like the one lady who's written the book, it's called it's This Chair Rocks, you know, rather than um, our stereotype of older people, older adults, older Americans, um, you know, um, what, and our society not valuing older people, you know, our society values youth. And so, um, you know, especially during the pandemic, there's been the discussion of like, were they gonna make choices that um, on the resources? 
where they were going to say, well, you know, these folks are old, they're going to die anyhow. So we'll give the resources to the younger people. Um, but, you know, the idea is that um, to change the stereotype, to show that like World Elder Abuse Awareness Day is one of the things they'll do is um, on some of those campaigns they have at the um, their themes that they have. I'm waiting to see what this year's theme is and what they're doing, but they'll show what older people are doing, you know, what they <laughs> the value that we have uh, to society. So in that one slide um, that it talks about how we're undervaluing um, older adults, um, you know, and writing them off um, and not appreciating the resource that they are and not respecting and providing, you know, the um, the respect that we should be giving to older people. Um, I was asking myself the other, I have a geriatric poodle that I have, um, <laughs> I thought was going to pass away a year ago. And I was like, well, I'm at home. I might as well take care of him. And, you know, he's incontinent and has all kinds of issues. And the other day I was asking myself if I was being ageist and how I was to making, trying to make a decision whether it was time to put him down or not. You know, uh, he's in, he has a decent quality of life. Am I, am I making that choice just because he's old or, is, you know, so it could apply in a lot of situations. That's true, that's true. Do we have any other questions? Not a peep. Well, thank you, Judy, your information was wonderful. And thank you, Lori, for arranging this. And uh, thank you, attendees. I know you, uh, uh, in spite of this pandemic, we still have busy lives and appreciate you attending. And Judy, thank you so much for sharing your uh, knowledge and your wisdom. You're welcome. All right. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye, -bye. Bye.